Good everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's um, meeting presentation and community workshop for the San Gabriel Valley Council of Government, San Gabriel Valley Transit Feasibility Study. Um, we're happy to present our findings for, uh, for our study, uh, which has culminated in a, uh, over a two and a half year effort. Uh, prior to beginning, next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that interpretation is available today for Spanish and Mandarin speaking speakers. To select your language, if you are using a mobile device, please tap your screen and then select the three dots, then select your link, uh, the language interpretation, select Spanish or Mandarin, and to finalize your option, pl uh, please pr uh, select done. If you're using a computer, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Please click the globe and then select Spanish or Mandarin and then, you, and then you're done and you should be um, good to go. So thank you so much. And I'll allow our Spanish interpreter and our Mandarin interpreter to interpret what I just said in English. Thank you, Roy. Um, hola a todos, bienvenidos. Tenemos interpretación en español disponible. Para seleccionar su idioma, si está usando un dispositivo móvil, por favor, toque su pantalla, seleccione los tres puntos. Seleccione el idioma de interpretación español. Seleccione silenciar el audio original y para finalizar su opción, por favor, seleccione finalizando. Y si está usando una computadora, puede apretar el, el botón de globo ubicado en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Por favor, haga clic en el globo. Terraquio, seleccione español, luego seleccione silenciar el audio original y listo. Gracias. Ahora la intérprete de mandarín va a estar probando las instrucciones.欢迎大家今天来参加我们的这个听证的服务 and uh, um, we should allow a few minutes for those that need interpretation services to sign on for the instructions. Vamos a dar unos pocos minutos para las personas que necesitan interpretación y aprieten el botón. Ahora,我们给大家几分钟的时间，让那些需要来登入语言服务的这个管道的人，呃，一点时间能够登入。Okay, next slide, please. I uh, just wanted to go through some housekeeping items today. Today's meeting is being recorded. All attendees' videos are off and mics are muted. Uh, however, you may uh, submit your questions and comments by clicking the chat uh, icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. And last but not least, this presentation will be recorded and provided on the SGD Council of Government website by Friday, December 1st. Next slide. Uh, again, thank you so much for attending today's meeting. My name is Roy Choi, and I'm the manager of transportation uh, with the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments. Um, I'm happy to uh, uh, present our findings and our recommendations uh, from our last two and a half years of effort uh, uh, to derive transit alternative enhancements that would replace the missed opportunities uh, from the gold line um, extension that will not be extended through uh, the, to the east portion of eastern portion of the San Gabriel Valley. So I just wanted to let you know that we started this study process over two and a half years ago. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible today uh, to 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 be here studying these uh, efforts and going through this uh, study effort to identify um, 
alternatives that would benefit the, the residents in the San Gabriel Valley region if it weren't for the assistance uh, of Supervisor District 1 to uh, Supervisor uh, Hilda Solis, who helped provide dedicated funding for the project. And with without uh, Metro's assistance and as being a partner for the project to help assist and fund the project as well. So we're very uh, grateful for those that helped to get us here. Um, I also would be remiss to uh, not um, acknowledge the our consultant staff team uh, led by Kim Lee Horn. Later on um, in the presentation, I will be handing off the technical portion of the presentation to Brent Ogden, our project manager from Kim Lee Horn. And then we will have, um, uh, I believe, Ricky uh, Choi from the San Gabriel Valley Council of Government, who, uh, who is our director of government relations, government and community relations will be providing a summary of the um, outreach efforts. Um, this two and a half year effort has culminated into an, a final vision plan. So we wanted to let you guys know how we got to providing the final recommendations that will be included in the final report. We have accompanying uh, engineering drawings that help to verify that what we're proposing is indeed feasible. And we wanted to also go through a quick summary of our outreach efforts. This has been, a, like I said earlier, it has been a very collaborative effort between all the stakeholders, including our residents, our writers, our stakeholders and general stakeholders, including uh, city staff and local city officials. So we believe we have, uh, you know, we derived a set of improvements uh, that we that would enhance transit. Um, in the subregion. So with that, um, I wanted to hand it off the, the presentation to Brent Ogden, our technical consultant. Thank you, Roy. Um, this is the study schedule. Uh, the top row of boxes there was what was conducted during phase one, which was a 21-22 effort. Um, we, had, we identified the study area, uh, identified initial alternatives, which were then screened, and we conducted ridership and uh, cost estimating, uh, leading to the phase one study report. In phase two, we've been working on advancing the conceptual design of those alternatives by developing examples for how they could be applied to various street sections within the San Gabriel Valley along the designated BRT routes that are in the, in the vision plan. We uh, refined those alternatives. We uh, married them up with some conceptual design studies of urban uh, urban design opportunities at the stations and uh, updated the vision plan. So uh, that's what I'm here to present today. Um, next slide, please. This is the study area map. At the time the study was started, it was still the L line um, serving both uh, the foothill, sort of the foothill portion, and then the east side. Gold line, of course, now that's uh, the foothill is now the A line and it's blue and the east side is still gold, but it's the it's the E line now. So um, at all the other maps, you'll see those new delineations. Um, the key thing here is that the study area is focused along the SR60 corridor so that, you know, primarily between 10 and 60 is where we're looking for uh, new services. Um, we did consider the entire valley and so that there are uh, services which extend into the blue zone uh, for connectivity purposes to uh, provide mobility options in all directions. Next slide, please. Um, we took a quick look at um, the rail mode and it was very quickly determined that the 600 million plus that Metro has committed uh, to construction is not adequate to do a rail type solution in the valley that would go enough distance to really be effective. So we then turn to uh, rubber tired modes. Next slide, please. Um, these are uh, different ways of doing the rubber tired service. Uh, on the left, you'll see a uh, rapid bus or a BRT. Um, the Wilshire Rapid started out in mixed flow, but it did have a transit priority and it had uh, widely spaced stops, which uh, increased its efficiency. And then subsequently a bus lane was added and uh, that uh, increased the uh, speed of service 
considerably and that, that made it a true BRT service. Uh, the two in the middle are other BRT examples. Those are center running. Uh, the Pulse is the East Coast, SBX, you can see out in uh, San Bernardino. And on the far right are uh, BRT type services or express bus services that are running in dedicated rights of way. That's again, those are probably too costly for us to provide. We're really focusing more on uh, something like the Wilshire BRT type of solution uh, where it's running on street. Uh, next slide, please. Just to sort of um, capture all the features of BRT, um, it has uh, bus lanes at various locations. So we'll be looking at new uh, zero emission buses, uh, transit priority, the signals, uh, long service span um, all day long, uh, spaced out stops, which helps the speed uh, Im improve, and then frequent service all day long, and then um, new stations with uh, bus arrival times provided at the station. So that's that's the true BRT service. Um, we started out with 15 initial concepts, basically looking at every possible way of extending out of either the existing Atlantic Station terminus for the rail or out of Union Station. Um, so the east-west ones are shown in orange and the north-south ones are shown in green. These 15 were screened down um, using uh, analysis of uh, ridership and input from stakeholders and uh, also looking at the study goals and, and metrics. And they were screened down to seven. That's on the next slide. Uh, so we have uh, three east-west and four north-south. Um, the uh, these were all evaluated in terms of ridership, and and they were, they were found to be uh, the the north south ones that are shown there in green were the ones that were found to be most effective working with the east west. In terms of the east west, we had three initial options, but we um, screened out uh, option number two because that had very low ridership, and then we looked at combining one and five to make a hybrid. Uh, that would give us a single route from east to west throughout the entire uh, length of the valley. The next slide shows that uh, screened east-west uh, hybrid alignment. So it would, it would start at, at Atlantic Station. It would come up Atlantic to Garvey, go out Garvey uh, to El Monte, and then uh, transit through El Monte going north on Santa Anita and then heading east on Valley Boulevard. Um, it would come off Valley Boulevard at Hacienda, and cross over uh, the Halliburton to Kalima Road, uh, where it would, would access uh, some land uses that are in the uh, hills south of the 60, uh, that where the service is not quite so significant right now, so it would improve service in that district. And then it would uh, transit back north across the railroad corridor up to the colleges um, in Pomona, including uh, Mount San Antonio and Cal Poly. And then come into Pomona via Holt, uh, terminating at the, the downtown transit center. And that was the way that uh, service was proposed. The red shows locations where bus lanes uh, could potentially be feasible, and the uh, purple shows locations where the service would run in mixed flow, either because the uh, traffic levels are so low that it wouldn't really, really benefit to have the bus lanes, or because of, of feasibility issues of being able to fit them in. Um, next slide, please. So the um, that east-west service that was refined at the beginning of this phase two effort was then um, we updated the the uh, the master plan to put that service in there. So you'll see that uh, running east-west. Um, we also found that the Rosemead service had a very very high demand and so um, adequate enough to justify uh, maybe considering a BRT service running along Rosemead. And so there were some segments within the San Gabriel Valley where we could have uh, bus lanes along Rosemead as well. The, um, the blue routes, which you see, which are primarily the north-south ones, those are uh, designated as uh, bus priority corridors and they would be given transit priority treatments and uh, could be suitable for uh, hosting rapid bus services uh, which would be uh, having fewer stops than local services, and that would um, provide enhanced uh, transit to those north-south corridors. And then there are two, two east-west ones also for the priority bus, the Valley Boulevard between downtown Los Angeles and El Monte, and then east of El Monte, the Amar route, where uh, 
Foothill Transit is currently running high frequency service. Um, so that's the that's the proposed long term plan. There's also some um, money available to purchase zero emission buses. And uh, so here's the the programmatic uh, capital program for the entire program would include, and we we'll start looking at the 2023. Uh, costs uh, 35 million for transit priority enhancements at up to 180 uh, intersections. Uh, looking for the east west, we have about 17 and a half miles of dedicated lanes on the east west route, and that would come in at anywhere from 200 to 250 million. Uh, the north south service that I mentioned on Rosemead, two, about 2.4 miles in the San Gabriel Valley at, at the cost of approximately 50 million. Uh, the uh, electric Electric buses or zero emission buses. They could be uh, they could be uh, hydrogen fueled. Um, we those are about a you know million a piece when you add the contingencies and everything. We'd be, be looking at forty million for that, and then that would leave about one hundred twenty five to one hundred fifty million for fixed facilities, which would be the uh, transit center improvements. And we looked at uh, inflating those costs out to uh, twenty thirty five, which is when the money is available. Um, using either 4% or 2% uh, escalation factor. And it's still affordable. Um, program is still affordable it, using the 2035 uh, estimated cost. So um, this is all feasible with the money that Metro has committed in terms of the capital. Um, next slide, please. And then we also have a long range vision plan that we developed. And this one does not have a date, nor does it have a cost associated with it. We don't have the funding for all these improvements. But what this long term plan anticipates is it anticipates that some of these bus priority corridors uh, running north south, they would be uh, put other candidates for future BRT services. So that would include the Atlantic service to the west, it would include the um, Azusa service uh, to the east of the 605, and then at the far east in Pomona, a, a service uh, going up wide and out arrow connecting downtown Pomona with Pomona North Station, and that could also be an alternative terminus for the east-west service. So um, there's quite a lot in this long-term plan. The one other thing that's in here uh, is also consideration for possible rail service along the Alhambra subdivision of the Union Pacific Railroad. That's that black railroad line that runs uh, generally in the middle of the uh, study area, east-west. Um, it, it would have a stop in downtown Pomona, and we might be able to put some infill stops on that line uh, at other places in between downtown Los Angeles and Pomona. That's a very long-term proposition. It would require agreement uh, with the railroad. Next slide, please. Um, implementation of this vision plan, of course, there's a lot of steps to implement all these services. Uh, we, we need to do engineering, we need operating agreements, we uh, most importantly they need to identify the funding for operations and maintenance responsibilities, etc. Uh, from the point of view of uh, you as a member of the public, the most important thing that you can do uh, to support this plan is let your uh, local officials, electeds, uh, supervisors, council members, know that you're uh, in favor of having these improvements made in the San Gabriel Valley uh, for everybody's benefit, uh, because they'll be the ones that'll be making these decisions about uh, committing specific dollars to specific projects under the plan. Um, next slide, please. We've also identified, uh, because you know um, there was a lot of concern that the money is not gonna be available till 2035. So if there's something that could be done in the near term. So we've identified six opportunities for what we're calling jumpstart projects. These would be low cost uh, done with maybe just uh, some diamonds applied to the existing lanes and some signs indicating uh, bus lane operations, maybe uh, just, peak hour bus lanes. And there are various segments where we could do this. Uh, and so we've identified six potential locations and we are in the discussions with the cities that are uh, in these six different project areas to see if they're interested in partnering with the CARG to do a demonstration project. Uh, you, we, you know, we're, we're hoping to be able to get um, some money from uh, some of the improvements that be made to support the Olympics. Um, next slide, please. 
So what, what we've been doing this year primarily is working on the conceptual engineering aspects of this project. So we've produced uh, three documents. Um, the first document is the conceptual engineering report uh, that, that discusses every single line segment on that east-west and on the north-south service uh, in terms of uh, what, it, what it takes to make it uh, fit into the roadway cross-section. We have a companion urban design report that talks about opportunities for urban design integration at the station locations. And then we have a third document, which are concept plans. And these are sample plans of how to actually uh, strike the existing roadways to accommodate uh, these proposed bus lanes. Next slide, please. Um, so this is really what we're talking about when we talk about bus lanes. There's a side running prototype and there's a curb running prototype. Side running prototype, typically the outside travel lane is converted to bus only. Um, and uh, this is a very easy conversion in terms of the capital cost because it typically uh, primarily involves restriping, although there might be some pavement rehabilitation associated with it. Then, of course, the station construction. Um, side running plays well with bike lanes, as you can see. Um, there are two examples that we give there in the renderings on the right. The uh, top right is in the city of El Monte, and that's on Garvey Avenue looking east uh, into the intersection of Santa Anita, which is behind there. And then the bottom right view is Rosemead Boulevard, and that's a northbound uh, bus approaching at, at Rush Street Station, just north of Rush Street at where the Arco is there. Um, Next slide, please, is the curb running prototype. Now, the curb running prototype is a little bit trickier in terms of how it operates. Um, the bus lane would be operating along the curb, so it would displace parking. If it's parking there now, if it's essential to maintain the parking, the bus can be operated with the bus lane peak hour only, and that allows the parking to remain. Um, there are going to be some interferences in the curb lane uh, due to loading activities and UPS trucks, UPS trucks, mail trucks, uh, Amazon, whoever. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, the bus, if it encounters an obstacle in the lane, it can uh, weave around it and just drive past it and get back into the lane. The really big benefit from the lane occurs at the intersection where the bus being in its own lane can uh, proceed immediately without having to wait for other traffic. And uh, the other thing about the curb running is that right turns are then made from the bus lane at every intersection. So um, vehicles are allowed to migrate across the bus lane into driveways or make right turns, et cetera. Um, so it's a you know fairly flexible uh, solution. Um, it does not play well with a bike lane. Um, if you have a bike lane, you can combine it with the bus lane, but then you really need to make the lane wider for safety purposes. And we do have one segment where we have an example of a combined uh, bus and bike lane in, in El Monte in our uh, engineering studies. Next slide, please. Uh, then we also have mixed flow. As I mentioned, there's some segments where bus lanes are not warranted or where they infeasible. Um, downtown El Monte on Valley Boulevard, that's a view there in the upper left looking towards uh, Tyler, uh, between Tyler and Center Street. And uh, there's, uh, we envision the possibility of using trailblazers at this location painted onto the uh, sidewalk and in the crosswalks to sort of uh, give guide signs to people tr uh, transiting between the bus and the, and the rail that's there. And there's actually three three destinations and in, in ready to stop here. One is, of course, the BRT service, which would be on Valley Boulevard. And then uh, off to the side up Center Street is both the Metrolink station uh, on one side and on the other side of the road in there is the uh, El Monte trolley. So there's really three different principal services that are all available at that stop. And by having these trailblazers, people could follow these pavement markings and not get lost uh, transferring between these services at that location. Um, the other example for maybe using trailblazers is in the upper right, that's Kalima Road. Um, Kalima Road, we, we, we found it feasible to put in, uh, convert the outside lane once it's widened to six lanes continuously, the outside lane could potentially be a bus lane. Um, and again, at the uh, Puente Hills Mall, uh, trailblazers could be applied to uh, guide people onto the mall per se. 
Foothill Transit is currently, you know, operating a, a transit center along the curb face at the mall itself. Um, next slide. And then again, another little peek at the engineering product. So as I mentioned, the conceptual engineering report, it has these, uh, what we call these pane maps that are sort of showing uh, just window panes, looking at different portions of the service and whether the bus lane, what the extents would be of the bus lane versus just uh, mixed flow or transit priority segments. We have cross sections for, for every typical cross section of all these streets. And then there, um, there's a rendering there again of uh, that's curb running on Atlantic Boulevard at Cesar Chavez. That would be the stop for um, ELAC, uh, the East Los Angeles Community College. And that would be um, an extra large station would be put at that point because it's a high ridership location. Next slide. Um, these are the these are the maps that are that are in the engineering report showing where bus lanes are feasible. Uh, from left to right, going up Atlantic, out Garvey, uh, down Valley, across on Kalima, and then coming back into Pomona along Holt. Uh, next, please. And then there's also the Rosemead service. So, you know, the Rosemead service would, in order to really be feasible, would need to be operated in conjunction with um, Gateway Cities participation, uh, which would then potentially deliver bus lanes within Pico Rivera and other jurisdictions to the south. Um, within the San Gabriel Valley, the two extents that uh, could be provided with bus lanes would be in the city of Rosemead, just north of the 10, and then in the city of South El Monte, just south of the 10. Um, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Um, look forward to answering any questions you might have. Good afternoon. So, um, so I'll be reviewing uh, some of the community outreach efforts uh, to date. Uh, throughout this study, uh, the COG has really put an emphasis on public outreach and engagement. Um, it's truly a priority for us, um, and we see it as an important part of this process uh, as we develop this feasibility study. Um, what you see here, this is um, uh, a snapshot um, of uh, the makeup of a survey that we conducted uh, early on during phase one. Um, it was an online survey to get insight on the mobility needs uh, and mobility habits and transit needs uh, of the folks in the Sango Valley region um, to help to really help us shape our analysis uh, and to give uh, give us some insight that would help us develop uh, the, these conceptual alternatives that we're considering. Uh, we received over 400 responses during a, a two month period uh, and this is just a snapshot, as I mentioned, of the respondents. Uh, and I'll be going over some of the feedback that we received. Uh, and I just want to highlight that um, through the survey, we, we did find that uh, of the respondents, 15% uh, uh, didn't mention that they did not have access to a car. 20% uh, uh, typically use public transit. Uh, and 30% uh, said that they took transit um, at least once a week. Next slide, next slide please. Um, so of those surveyed, um, the respondents indicated that they would ride buses more frequently um, if there were less congestion uh, along bus routes, uh, if they had better access uh, to buses, um, or if um, some of the stations were closer to home, um, and also if that there were more frequent service. Um, there was also mention of uh, the possibly um, for better sidewalks and, and lighting. Uh, that would be helpful and then also that if buses were um, a bit cleaner and safer. So these are just some of the feedback um, that we received on what we found could potentially uh, increase bus ridership. Uh, so conditions um, that would make folks ride buses more frequently. Next slide. Um, now during our earlier uh, community outreach efforts, um, we did uh, hold community workshops um, virtually. Uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, COVID ongoing concerns. Uh, the participants um, that participated uh, had expressed that um, uh, there was a need for uh, a safe and affordable public transportation. Um, and also, as you know, uh, the San Gabriel Valley uh, boasts a very high concentration of um, institutions of higher education. Um, and so there was a de desire for some um, that wanted to see uh, connections to universities and colleges in the region. 
Uh, folks also have a desire for improvements um, at bus stops, um, including uh, better lighting, landscaping. Uh, notable, there were participants that were interested in, in north, north, south routes as well, uh, and they wanted to see um, access uh, to more transit hubs. Next slide. Hi, Vicky. Um, sorry, just to step in, I believe um, we have a comment that it might be a little bit difficult to hear you. Maybe put the speaker a little louder or the volume, but thank you. How's this? You okay? I, yep, I believe that sounds louder. Thank you. Um, in terms of specific in, in improvements uh, um, that residents wanted to be implemented, um, they include service improvements that were really focused on uh, low-income communities um, and areas um, with low car availability, um, fat, uh, first last mile connections uh, with transit and bicycle friendly uh, infrastructure. They wanted new passenger service. Um, and as um, Brent, Brent mentioned, uh, along the UPR, um, Alhambra subdivision uh, with potentially stations uh, in the San Diego Valley, um, faster bus operations with more frequent service, uh, additional transit hubs, bus lanes, uh, direct connections, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to institutions of higher education, such as Cal CLA, ELAC, Mount SAC, uh, and Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, next slide. So during phase two of the study, uh, we sought out to really build uh, upon the outreach that we did during phase one uh, and continue the comprehensive outreach and community, community engagement efforts. Um, after the COVID-19 restrictions were lifted uh, and it was safe and we felt that we were at a better place in terms of living with COVID, uh, we pivoted and really um, started getting out there in the community uh, on the ground and interacting directly with the residents, stakeholders, and transit users. Uh, we conducted a series of outreach activities, including hosting a number of pop-ups at various community events throughout the Sangro Valley, um, and, at an, and also at a number of uh, transit centers in the area to really gather input and solicit feedback uh, from residents and, and, and key stakeholders to ensure that the needs uh, of the diverse communities of the Sangro Valley um, are taken into account. So what you see here is, is really just a list of events that we've tabled at uh, this past year. Um, throughout the region, including at um, in, in events at a number of cities and unincorporated communities uh, along the corridor um, and in areas where we're considering the concepts, uh, as well as at uh, the Cal, Cal Poly Pomona um, and at the El Monte Pomona and uh, Mount Sac Transit Centers. Uh, next slide, please. So at these community pop-up events, um, residents told us that they would like to see more transit service, of course, uh, additional transit hubs, faster bus operations, uh, more frequent service, um, and as I mentioned, direct connections to um, AP, uh, APU Citrus uh, and Azusa Metro rail stations, uh, and there was a desire to see a stop at Amar Road. Um, and then also, of course, um, service improvements uh, that centered in low-income communities and areas of uh, low car availability. Uh, next slide. Um, just really quickly, some additional outreach uh, activities that we uh, had conducted include uh, forming a TAC, a technical advisory committee that was made up of city representatives um, along the corridor um, and other stakeholders, including County Public Works, uh, County Regional Planning, Caltrans, transit agencies, uh, such as Metro, Metrolink, uh, Foothill Transit, and others. Uh, they met a couple of times uh, throughout uh, this two-year process. Uh, and the committee really has been instrumental in uh, helping us review and refine um, our conceptual alternatives. Uh, we, we also held a series of briefings for uh, public agencies and elected officials, um, as well as uh, stakeholder briefings, uh, where we invited um, key stakeholders from throughout the region, um, including nonprofits, community organizations, uh, business organizations, uh, school districts, uh, and tra transit agencies, of course. Uh, we held virtual community workshops uh, to provide information regarding uh, the study and to share a number of these conceptual alternatives that we're considering with the general public um, and also with the uh, key stakeholders um, to solicit feedback and input. Um, and I just and we just uh, held an in-person community workshop last night um, at the Hacienda Heights uh, Community Center. Uh, next slide, please. 
I also just wanted to mention briefly uh, and really quickly that we have a, uh, a study website uh, web page on the, the COGS uh, website dedicated to the Transit study um, with additional information and an, uh, an opportunity for the public to really obtain more information about the study in multiple languages. Uh, we have information provided uh, in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, there's interactive maps available as well if you'd like to view them. Um, and uh, and also, you know, provide any input or, or comment uh, or feedback that you may have. Um, we're finalizing the study, as, as was mentioned, um, but we're still continuing to take public comments through the end of the year. So we encourage you to participate uh, and submit any comments that you may have um, uh, by December 31st. And um, I think that's really basically it. Uh, as you can see, we've really had a, a very comprehensive public outreach and, and engagement effort um, during this process. Uh, and it's really focused on really connecting communities to opportunities, improving mobility, um, and making transit more accessible to, to all uh, in the region. So uh, with that, that's just a, a brief overview of our outreach efforts thus far. Uh, let me now turn it over to our uh, manager of transportation, Roy Choi, to talk about next steps. Thank you, Ricky. So we believe that our study efforts um, uh, have met the goals, uh, which included examining near-term and long-term mobility options that would replace the loss of rail services due to the um, inability to extend the gold, uh, the former gold line, now the uh, E line, further into the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, we have provided services that. Uh, uh, all day that provides all day rapid transit service via rubber tire um, that addresses um, service during the peak periods and all day. Uh, we believe that, that our proposed recommendations addresses the unmet mobility needs uh, within the San Gabriel Valley uh, and that we have provided accessible transit service for the communities uh, within the SGV. Uh, we have also considered urban freight needs uh, in our future plans. And we believe with all of that, we've developed transit service options that is compatible with surrounding land, uh, land uses. Uh, next slide. As previously mentioned, we had looked at all of the different modal options that we could use to basically capture um, some of these transportation enhancement benefits for the future. Um, we have uh, identified uh, bus rapid transit, uh, rubber tired service, um, uh, we believe that uh, you know uh, this is what with the with the funds that have been programmed for the project in 2035, we believe that uh, this will provide faster service up to 25% travel time savings. Uh, we will provide more frequent service. Uh, basically, um, uh, we will uh, increase headways and service frequencies between 10 to 15 minutes. We will have a longer span of service, basically means we will operate uh, um, longer into the evenings and possibly early in the mornings to provide a longer period of service that users can use our bus rapid transit services. Uh, we believe that with the dedicated lanes through portions of the uh, uh, recommended corridor alignment that we can uh, provide more reliability with service and with the new transit station upgrades, we envision uh, incorporating real-time arrival signs uh, that you might see at the Metro uh, subway and light rail system at their stations. So you will see hopefully a lessened anxiety regarding when the next bus would arrive at your stop. Um, and, you know, by providing these options, um, I'm not sure if many of you are uh, in attendance are aware, but the state has recently changed the ability for transportation planners and managers in the state to um, add additional capacity to our lanes uh, of highways and streets and so and freeways. So we will unfortunately no longer be building um, ourselves out of congestion by adding additional lane capacity in our in our in our uh, transportation network. So we are basically forced to um, better manage our existing resources and to uh, work with our um, communities to basically increase um, capacity within their existing um, network by adding um, opportunities for other transit modes, including bus and pedestrians and bicycling. Um, and, you know, as Brent had mentioned earlier, uh, we believe that 
in line with uh, um, the global climate change issues that we're all trying to address um, by 2035, um, we will have uh, zero emission electric buses that we would be procuring for, for the services. So we're happy to um, present it to you guys uh, the last two and a half years of work uh, with all of the um, uh, parties involved. I also wanted to give a special shout out because I just noticed that we have some attendees from uh, Supervisor uh, Roll District 1 um, uh, from uh, Supervisor Hilda Solis' office. We have in attendance today uh, the Transportation Deputy Karina Macias. And, and I also wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Marissa Saw who's been a partner with us uh, during the duration of the study uh, from Metro. And then we have Public Affairs Officer um, Tito Corona. So I wanted to thank you all for your assistance and for your partnership uh, over the last two and a half years to get us here to this date. Um, so I wanted to uh, express my gratitude to the team and to all of the people who have dedicated the lunch hour today to spend uh, your lunch time with us to give uh, us a, a uh, an opportunity to present our recommendations as we're finalizing the study efforts by the end of December. Um, as Ricky had noticed, uh, excuse me, as Ricky had mentioned previously, uh, we're, we are expecting to roll up the study and finalize our efforts by the end of December. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you cannot submit your comments. We actually encourage you to submit your comments that you may have. Uh, we have, I see 14 questions um, if we don't answer some of the comments and some of the questions that you might have within this meeting, you may be able to contact me directly the man, uh, as manager of transportation at Roy, R-O-Y, Choi, C-H-O-I, at sgbcog.org. Um, and, you know, last but not least, we would appreciate um, uh, your support for our study. Um, if you would like, we can always use your assistance. If you can, if you would uh, contact your local elected officials and let them know that you support the study and the findings and the recommendations included in, in our efforts. So with that, um, next slide, please. I'd like to open up the floor to uh, Q&A. If you have additional questions, please do submit them now. If you would allow me to, I'm going to read off the, the, the 16 questions that we have so far. Uh, I know at the beginning of this uh, discussion, we had uh, Brent and study team. We had a question from Stephen Scazzillo. I believe he is with the Southern California News Group who had requested study materials and I had directed him to look at our COG website. Um, also to you, Steve, and to the rest of our attendees today, there are a few uh, remaining documents that we have yet to upload onto the COG website. We, ex we expect to do that by the end of this week. So by early next week, if you were to visit our COG website at www.sgvcog.org backslash transit slash, uh, hyphen study, uh, you will find our uh, the, the documents and additional information regarding the study um, efforts and our documents are included uh, on the COG website. And so again, if you will check our website early next week, all of our documents should be up there for your review. Uh, with that, I'm going to proceed into um, the questions. So Brent, um, there was a question here that asked about why this SR60 route was not feasible for BRT. This area has limited high-speed transit options. Uh, there, uh, there is great need in this area, which is clogged by traffic along the 60 corridor and air quality is terrible. So I, I think, um, you know, we do have an SR60 parallel BRT service. That's the east-west hybrid. Uh, the question may have been referring to the light rail project along SR60, and that was deemed infeasible because of cost, environmental obstacles, and physical uh, constraints with the available right-of-way. I mean, I do recall that we did have a previous option along the 60 for BRT, and I believe, and please correct me if I'm incorrect, I believe we had screened that out because it's, you know, you have limited options to play stations along the freeway. So, and to, to access those stations along the center of the freeway would have been a little bit problematic. So I believe we had an impact on ridership and some of the ridership numbers didn't look as great as- Yeah, uh, no, the, the, way, the one that we did have a concept that was, uh, 
using various portions of the 60, but it was very little ridership because of the remote station locations. Yeah, and 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 for the for the member for the audience member that uh, asked this question today, um, th th that was one of the similar reasons why the light rail extension uh, was deemed not feasible uh, further into the east portion of the San Gabriel Valley, in addition to the environmental impacts and the costs uh, associated with that extension. So we do know that ridership was uh, was a function of of that determination from Metro staff. So hopefully we answered your question appropriately there. We did look at that. We just we we saw that it was not um, an efficient uh, option. So we had screened that out uh, from our earlier efforts. Um, second question: Could other travel lane width be narrowed to allow for bike lanes? The answer is yes, and uh, our cross sections uh, in some cases assume that. Uh, other lanes would be narrowed to accommodate both bike lanes and bus lanes. Yes, and as I previously noted, if any of the attendees would like those further details, um, we do have a, a conceptual engineering re engineering report that shows um, how uh, we can utilize the existing curb to curb width of the existing streets uh, without um, you know taking sidewalks or reducing sidewalk widths. And you will see that we have accommodated bicycle lanes for a, a good majority of the both alignments. Next question. Uh, did I hear you say there's no longer a plan to extend the A-line to Claremont and possibly beyond to up, Upland? Um, I, I don't know if we made any comment about that. I mean, the, the A-line is supposed to be built through to Pomona North uh, by 2035. Um, beyond that, it would uh, involve the participation of San Bernardino County. So I don't know if Metro can uh, provide an answer to that. I think there might, you know, if I can jump in prior to Metro, yeah. I think there might have been a confusion here. So, you know, you, you know, previous to the redesignation of the Gold Line, Foothill Gold Line and the, just the Gold Line, uh, Metro had recently gone through a uh, an effort to uh, rebrand uh, the, the 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 nomenclatures and naming of the lines. So the 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 foothill extent the, the foothill gold line along the north portion of our San Gabriel Valley subregion uh, is the A line. Uh, the E line is uh, along uh, south of the 60 freeway, and that's the option, and that's the alignment that will no longer be extended further east. So I hope that clarifies your question. And if Metro, uh, if you guys wanted to add on any clarification, if I misspoke, please do so. Um, but I believe that I think that's what you were asking for. Yeah. Hi, Tito Corona, Metro Community Relations Manager, San Gabriel Valley Representative. Um, uh, no, you you are correct about the uh, the alignment on the 60 no longer being considered. And now it's going uh, uh, through the Gateway Cities. Uh, the extension of the E-line, uh, essentially, eventually ending in Whittier. But uh, back to the question of the A-line, which is what uh, runs on the foothills section right now. Um, the uh, As Brett was saying, right now, the construction is currently going underway um, to extend the to extend the A-line uh, to Pomona North. And from what I recall, the schedule has it been completed in 2025. Um, we're about a year and a half away from opening or from completing that uh, through the Gold Foothill Gold Line Construction Authority. So that segment is being constructed as we speak. And there are still plans from the Construction Authority and through the San Gabriel Valley COG uh, to complete the initial um, scope, which was to build this all the way to Montclair. So uh, the cities of Claremont and Montclair are still not fully funded, but uh, we're, you know, uh, they're going through uh, all the efforts to try to find the funding to to finish those last two cities. So um, hopefully that could be uh, accomplished within the next uh, year or so, so they can continue on with the uh, construction of the A-line uh, to Montclair. So, um, but I did want to clarify again, it's 2025 um, when we anticipate the completion of the construction for the A-line um, currently from Glendora to uh, Pomona North. Thank you. Thank you, Tito. And I also, if you allow me to add a little bit of a context to that as well, uh, the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments also has a relative project that would help enhance 
uh, connectivity to and from those uh, transit station, future transit stations in the East San Gabriel Valley. Um, uh, please excuse me for the long title, but the title of the project is called the East San Gabriel Valley Multimodal uh, Sustainable Multimodal Improvement Project, or, or what we've been calling SMIP, S-M-I-P for short. So the COG is leading an effort with uh, seven partner cities in the Eastern San Gabriel Valley region, subregion, to uh, basically that includes the cities of Azusa, Claremont, Covina, Glendora, Laverne, Pomona, and San Dimas. We will be working to uh, design and uh, and construct um, a street improvements that would allow bicycle connectivity and pedestrian connectivity, uh, safe connectivity uh, to and from these stations. So um, we will be initiating that project in the early part of next year. So we're hoping to improve access for the community and the residents within those cities. So to support uh, you know access to those stations. So hopefully we answered your questions about that. The next question is, um, who do you envision operating the East-West BRT line? I think I could answer that uh, if you don't mind, Brent. At this, uh, uh, you know, we are at the infancy of this project. We are in the planning, what they call the planning stage, where we're trying to determine the feasibility of these services and, and, and the proposed alignments. So what we have done so far is to work with you and intends today, along with other stakeholders, including the city staff and officials, and um, uh, other stakeholders in the general region. Um, we've obtained input from our electeds. Uh, and, and so we derived our, our alignment concept that we've been presented today. What will need to be uh, studied further after this phase is exactly that. One of these issues is exactly that, but we have heard from Foothill Transit, the executive director, that there is strong interest from Foothill Transit to operate the proposed services within the, within the that are proposed within the study. Um, we But we will uh, address that as well in the next phase of the study. Um, you know, moving forward, um, as Brent alluded, alluded, we are, we have identified early jumpstart projects for which Metro on behalf of the LA County, uh, greater LA County and especially, and, and definitely the uh, San Gabriel Valley subregion has submitted a, a grant application in excess of $130 million recently to the federal government. We anticipate hearing back from them early part of next year to see if we were awarded the funding to be able to implement some of these services. And, and, and it, should we be awarded that grant fund um, uh, we will go into the next phase of the study, which will be to environmentally clear the project and to uh, final uh, to basically engineer um, beyond the conceptual engineering phase to basically have a final set of engineering drawings so that we can construct some of these early start uh, jump start improvements. Hopefully that answers your question. We had a uh, question from Zana. Um, do you have estimates of the right time for these routes? It's very disappointing to see, to see that BRT no longer goes along Valley and Alhambra to connect Union Station and instead connects to Atlantic Station along Garvey. Um, so the yes, the east-west route um, is 35, about 34 miles long. The travel time is estimated to be about 100 minutes. Uh, if you do the math, that works out to 20 miles per hour, which is actually a, a very good speed for a, uh, a surface bus operation. Um, with regard to Valley Boulevard in Alhambra, um, the city indicated to us that the improvements that they're currently planning to implement along Valley Boulevard would preclude the installation of bus lanes in, in that jurisdiction. And uh, we were also told the same thing by the city of San Gabriel. Uh, we did include Valley Boulevard, that segment that you're talking about it is included as a priority bus corridor. So it is proposed to get uh, transit priority enhancements and Metro is already operating a high frequency service al along Valley. So um, it's, it's sort of half in, it's not fully BRT though. Hopefully that answers your question, Donna. Uh, we also have a question from Machico. Uh, why was the Valley Boulevard option removed? To what extent were the city of Humber staff and city council involved in these discussions? 
Well, I, that's sort of the same question again. And again, we heard pretty strongly from the city of Alhambra that it was not going to be compatible with their um, transportation plan for Valley Boulevard. Yeah, and I believe the city had concerns with the existing congestion. Um, you know, they unfortunately have to bear the brunt of the, the 710 uh, uh, where it ends and basically dump the traffic into their city. So there was concerns that they wanted to make sure that there was enough capacity on their roadways to accommodate general purpose automobiles. Um, and there just wasn't enough capacity to dedicate BRT lanes through the city and on Valley Boulevard. So uh, we have an anonymous question here. What is the UPRR Alhambra subdivision? Okay, and if we could bring up, uh, maybe bring up uh, number number 15, um, slide 15, can you bring that back up? Just uh, the long-term plan. And as we go up to slide here. number 15, uh, if we're all okay uh, with going a little bit past one, just to answer more questions, if everybody's okay with that, we're more than glad to do that. So the Alhambra subdivision is the, the line that's delineated in black uh, that starts at Union Station area and it goes uh, through El Monte. And um, if you're, you know, in in uh, Alhambra, uh, it's in the trench in Alhambra along Mission. Um, and then uh, east of El, El Monte, it's, it's par paralleling Valley Boulevard, it's immediately to the um, to the south of Valley Boulevard, just east of uh, El Monte, but then it crosses over it at Hacienda Valley Boulevard crosses over. So then the Alhambra subdivision is on the right hand side as you're going east and south of the Valley Boulevard. It basically parallels Valley Boulevard uh, pretty closely. And um, that subdivision is currently has a lower uh, level of train traffic on it than the um, Los Angeles subdivision, which uh, goes to Riverside. So that's why we identified it as a candidate. Now, you want to read the next question, Roy? I apologize. I was on mute. Uh, Stephen had another question. Um, what would be the improved bus service along Rosemead Boulevard, Lakewood Boulevard look like? Would this go from mountains to Long Beach? Is that uh, a good question? Well, it, well, it could. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, in, in the San Gabriel Valley, we're proposing to operate the service uh, heading out of the Sierra Madre Villa station. Um, when you talk about access to the mountains, maybe there would be shuttle buses into the mountain parks up you know, connecting to that location. But we were looking at BRT service with bus lanes uh, proceeding south from Sierra Madre Villa along Rosemead Boulevard in the long term, potentially through East Pasadena uh, with additional segments, as I indicated previously in Rosemead and in, in South El Monte. South of the San Gabriel Valley, the gateway cities would be involved in developing uh, the improvements to support that type of service. And then uh, with, with enough bus lanes in place, both in the San Gabriel Valley and the Gateway Cities, then it would be feasible to um, operate a, BR, a true BRT service. And, and again, that would require a lot of coordination because there's a lot of operators involved in that service, uh, you know, including Metro and Long Beach Transit. So, um, but it is feasible. Yeah, and to further add on to that, Stephen, I just wanted to let you know if you if you look at the map that we're showing this long term vision plan along Rosemead, you see that red dotted arrow. So, uh, uh, to, to further kind of add some of the additional details on the efforts from led by the Gateway Cities Council of Governments, um, they are going through a similar planning effort right now because they do have a plan on their books to have an ultimate corridor a vision for a, a BRT corridor that spans from the southern boundary of the San Gabriel Valley all the way through Long Beach. So uh, you must be aware of these plans already. So unfortunately, however, the $635.5 million that would be made available by 2035 uh, per our midterm plan is only, to, uh, is only specifically to be used within our San Gabriel Valley to benefit our residents. So we are uh, working in concert with them to share our information and share our results to see um, where they could pick up from 
the border of our two subregions and for them to take on their, that effort to realize uh, that connection south of uh, SUV subregion down to Long Beach. Uh, we do have another question from Machico. Were any city councils and city staff against new bus rapid transit? If so, which cities and who? Well, Roy, I mean, we I think we already sort of indicated that we heard from Alhambra yeah. and Gabriel that they didn't think it was compatible with the operations on Valley Boulevard. And also we heard from uh, Temple City that, uh, you know, the Temple City has recently made improvements along Rosemead that they felt would preclude bus lanes. So those are the three that we've heard from that that have uh, indicated that the, the plan's not compatible with their vision for their cities. Yeah, Other and, that, and we haven't heard any that's against it. Yeah, and specifically in regards to Temple City, I just wanted to be fair. They did spend a lot of time and money to recently implement protected bike lanes. So that was their concern that we our efforts would counter, you know, what they just recently had done and, and the uh, an expense that, that took place to implement those protected bike lanes. So we understand. And so through that area will be mixed flow. Um, next question, where can the public submit comments on the study? So I think I mentioned earlier today, um, you know, if you don't have all your questions or comments that, that you're able to su submit today, we are recording the comments today. Um, and you may contact me directly at R-O-Y-C-H-O-I, all one word, at SG, the at sign, sgbcog.org. Uh, please email me directly regarding your comments and they will be made into the record for the study. Uh, next question from an anonymous attendee. Does your cost estimate cover all the proposed north, south, and east, west routes or just one route in each direction? Um, well, it covers um, all of the north, south routes um, in terms of transit priority and um, also the sections of bus lane along Rosemead that we found potentially feasible. And then in the east-west direction, it would it would include the bus lanes along the hybrid route between Atlantic Station and Pomona, uh, but it would also include uh, bus priority along Valley Boulevard west of downtown El Monte and along MR Road east of uh, downtown El Monte along with uh, money for uh, purchase of 30 uh, zero emission buses and some money to make improvements at the transit uh, centers and operation centers. So all of that is included in the uh, programmatic cost estimate. Yeah, and, and then the cost table that we might've shared earlier, well, we made sure that we took a look at what these costs are today and inflated them uh, with, a, with including current inflation rates um, so we're 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 assuming that uh, per our cost estimates that we can afford everything that we we presented to you today. So uh, Zana has another question. Also, why is the time interval of ten to fifteen minutes considered rapid? It should be five to ten minutes max. Well, ten to fifteen minutes is the minimum headway, and uh, five to ten minutes would be desirable. <laughs> so it's just a matter of funding. Yeah, and, and and as I alluded to earlier, Zana, um, the next one of the next things that we do have to study uh, would be um, who would be on first to to implement these services, and we will be getting into an operational analysis at the next phase of the study as well. So where we will further address that uh, that that question that you had to see if we can um, add additional frequency to the services. Um, we had another question from an anonymous attendee today. Will any changes to existing local street, local transit routes or service levels be made when these proposed BRT routes are implemented? Yeah, it's usually the customary to make uh, adjustments in the existing route structure when new routes are added. So that would be definitely part of the process of looking how to operate. Because uh, when you look at operating, you're not just looking at operating this one service, you're looking at operating everything that you've already got plus this. So uh, sometimes it requires some revisions. Right, and where we do have existing service, those multiple operators, if that's the case, um, we do have multiple operators along that segment of the proposed corridor, all would tend to benefit because um, it doesn't matter who, which operator would be operating on the street, as long as you're a transit bus, you would be able to use those dedicated landings and facilities. 
So um, hopefully that answers your question. We do have another question from EC. I, uh, hi, I hope, uh, I think best bus interior hygiene should also be a top priority, especially after COVID-19. Um, perhaps Metro staff, Tito, did you want to answer this? I know in addition to hygiene and security, Metro has been working uh, sorry, working really hard in the last several months uh, to make sure that our transit services, the rail service, the bus service are, are indeed safe. They're ha they are um, looking at how to uh, potentially increase security by possibly um, doing security in-house um, uh, through Metro staff to make the uh, security operations a little bit more efficient and less, less costly. So um, if you wanted to add anything to that, Tito and or Marissa, um, I know that work, you know, Metro is basically working. They are aware of the concerns of our writers and the public, and they're working really hard to address those concerns. Hi, yes, Roy, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, I would like to confirm what you just stated. Yes, Metro is taking a um, a robust look at our cleaning practices, and we are stepping up to um, focus on making sure that our services are clean and safe, especially as we approach the Olympics in 2028. And we want uh, we want to make sure that we put our best foot forward um, and making sure that um, we have a service that is accessible to all. So thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, we have another anonymous question. Would would the implementation of BRT affect zoning density regulation around bus stops? Well, it could. It's not necessary for this to succeed to have that happen. But, um, you know, if we're talking about locations like Pointy Hills Mall, there's been talk about putting a lot of housing at that location. So, you know, one of the things when we first cited these uh, route opportunities was to look at um, act existing activity centers and look at um, land uses that anticipate uh, improved transportation. So like in particular that uh, where the service swings south of the 60 uh, down Halliburton and along Kalima Road, the County of Los Angeles has been developing specific plans to in intensify land uses in that area. And uh, this this service would, would support that. So, um, yeah, it's a compatible thing to look at the land use. Thank you, Brent. Uh, we have a question from uh, Marissa Garcia. Will there be an opportunity for public comment during this meeting or must or must all public comments be submitted by email? Um, yeah, well, so I hope that uh, I address, I think I addressed this earlier. Um, uh, if you do have additional questions, Marissa, you can ask them now. If you don't feel comfortable with asking those questions uh, with part of the broader group, you could email me your questions directly and we will respond to them as soon as possible. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we do have another question, an anonymous question. Are you envisioning for the proposed East-West BRT line to run on top of existing service? If so, do you envision reducing their frequencies due to the presence of the East-West BRT line? So this is sort of an ongoing um, operations planning exercise. Um, you know, initially this east-west line is viewed as a new line. Um, there are portions of the route, matter of fact, many locations along the route where there are existing services. Um, those existing services would continue to operate, but potentially the frequencies would be adjusted based upon the, the ridership demand. Uh, when when uh, LA Metro initiated the uh, Wilshire BRT, they initially uh, put the BRT in, in addition to all the local service that was already along Wilshire. But then um, as the riders got accustomed to using the new service, they found that riders were actually choosing to um, use the BRT service in lieu of the local bus service, and they did cut back on the frequencies of the local service based upon the uh, popularity of the BRT service. So this is just uh, sort of an ongoing uh, fine tuning of the network that, that could occur after the, the route is initiated. Thank you, Brent. Uh, we have a question from Dorothy Wong. How does this SCV plan support connections such as travel between LA and OC and the Inland Empire? especially from transit hubs. As a transit user having to go 
to Union Station to get from Anaheim to Azusa would take two and a half hours. So sadly, I had to drive, which um, takes about 45 minutes via freeway during rush hour. Well, the uh, the long range vision plan um, provides, well, first of all, we've got, you know, the Western Gateway is Union Station. So uh, we do, you know, connect into Union Station uh, via the, uh, the E-Line um, on the eastern end of the study area, we, we're tying into Pomona downtown and Pomona North, which are both Metrolink uh, locations. Uh, and uh, you can get on Metrolink and, and get to other destinations further to the east uh, from those points. Um, we also are showing some connections to the south, to Orange County, in particular, the uh, one of the north-south routes that goes through Diamond Bar, we would envision that. Uh, North-South service terminating at Brea Mall, which would uh, hub with the Orange County services, and also the Azusa line coming down to Pointe Hills Mall uh, potentially could be extended uh, via Fullerton and Harbor down to uh, down to the uh, Brea vicinity. So, um, yeah, there definitely are some possible extensions to the south. Uh, some of these things would require you know, coordination and cooperation with adjacent districts. Thank you, Brent. Uh, next question. Will the Metro Board be taking any action on the study? Um, I think I could answer that. So uh, the next steps, I should have gone through that prior to the questions and the answers, but uh, what we will do, what we will be doing after the conclusion of the study at the end of December, we will be presenting this, uh, the study, um, findings to the San Gilva Valley Council of Governments Transportation Committee, then followed by the our governing board. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, to those two, uh, our committees and, and governing board meetings, uh, we will take this to the Metro Board for the review and consideration as well in the spring of next year. Um, hope that answers your question. We had another question. We know with almost 100% certainty that any mixed traffic bus lanes would be sold in cars and delivery vehicles stopping in the bus lane and impeding buses from moving quickly. Having the bus go ahead is not an actual solution. I'm curious if there's recommendation including in the study for cities to have automatic bus lane enforcement cameras to automatically give tickets to vehicles parked or stopped in bus lanes. If it's not included, can it please be included? Um, San Francisco has a pilot project where they are uh, they have cameras on their on their buses and they uh, they cannot issue citations they they issue what are called warnings and it's a you know an evolving legal situation so in order to really have uh, true enforcement there'd have to be a state law would have to embrace that type of a solution uh, but the technology is there and it's being used on a trial basis and um, the uh, keeping the lanes clear is sort of a combination of um, using the red paint, <laughs> uh, which actually Muni also found out that painting the entire lane red was uh, more beneficial than just pointing it, uh, painting it just at the intersections. So it has to do partly with how it's delineated and partly uh, with actual enforcement activities, whether they're automated or, or by uh, police vehicles. You know, when we, when the Wilshire BRT was was commissioned, um, the uh, there was a huge enforcement effort to get that off the ground, and hundreds of vehicles were towed away by the parking control, and uh, the sheriff was actually monitoring that lane and issuing moving moving citations to moving uh, citations uh, for moving vehicles that were violating those lanes. So um, all these things are part of sustaining these bus lanes. Hope that answers your question. Uh, we had another question, follow up on BRT and density. If BRT can affect density regulations, at what stage would this take place? Uh, would jumpstart projects involving bus lane implementation impact density regulations? Well, I mean, in addition to the BRT, I think what's really driving our density regulations is the state of California. Uh, all the cities in the state are required to accommodate uh, low income housing. Um, if they would like to proceed with receiving state and federal funding for, for their housing needs. So I know my previous position was with the city of Burbank for the last 12 years, uh, prior to my position here with the city of Burbank. So it's not an option anymore. And, you know, the cities can no longer ditch and hide uh, 
to meet their um, housing obligations. So we do have statewide mandates in place that require updates to the housing element in each of the city's general plans to identify how they will uh, address uh, accommodating those additional housing needs uh, that they're forced to basically provide uh, by the state of California. So in addition to that, I mean, do you, do you have any other additional response to how BRT can effectuate uh, density regulations and by when, Brent? Um, I think that's more of a long-term uh, proposition as far as the density regulations. There are existing um, state uh, mandates that actually um, allow for some higher density improvement along transit corridors that are already in place and BRT would um, actually uh, result in the you know creation of a of a transit cor corridor that could uh, leverage off of existing uh, density uh, provisions from the state of California um, I don't think you know as far as the jumpstart projects those are meant to be uh, temporary trial projects that could be made permanent if they're successful and uh, I don't I don't think there'd be any land use changes associated with them yeah I'm with you I think at the earliest we might see anything is after the midterm implementation which is 12 years from now by 2035 so hopefully that answers your question to the anonymous anonymous attendee who had asked the question we have another question from Dorothy Wong in short how does the SGD plan support regional connectivity well, all of the services that we're showing in the plan, whether they're priority bus or rapid bus, they all terminate um, at, at regional connectivity points such as rail stations. So we tie into uh, Metrolink stations internally. We tie into Metrolink uh, in Pomona and uh, downtown Los Angeles. Um, and uh, even things like the Puente Hills Mall could become a, a connection to uh, regional connectivity of services brought in from the south. We also have uh, two connections to the uh, new transit center at Mount San Antonio College. Uh, we're working in concert with, uh, you know, we've uh, noted that we will have a stop at the future transit station that Cal Poly Pomona is working to place and locate within their uh, um, college facility. So uh, we do have multimodal options to where you can transfer on to other bus systems and or um, light rail uh, and, and commuter rail via Metrolink. So hope that answers your question, Dorothy. Um, another question, how does Lakewood Rosemead propose to relate to what Metro is considering for Lakewood Rosemead in relation to the I-605 freeway corridor? Well, we've been working with Gateway Cities. Um, we've had some meetings with Pico Rivera to look at um, extending the, the, the Rosemead down in through Pico Rivera, and it definitely is feasible to that point. And um, Gateway Cities is in the process of uh, looking further uh, at, at Lakewood and Rosemead to the south. Um, I think that would be the, you know, I don't know if there's anybody else who can give a more up-to-date um, answer on what's going on with the, the gateway cities, but um, we've been coordinating with them as we went forward. Is there any additional contact, Marissa or Tito, if you're still on, to provide to that question? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, but what I can do is relay that question um, over uh, to Tito to provide clarification. And so um, if we have your contact information or if you wanted to just reach out to Roy, then we'll be happy to um, coordinate a response. So thank you for that, Marissa. To the anonymous attendee who inquired about this question, if you would like some further details or response to your, uh, uh, to your question um, in detail, please do email me at roychoy at roychoy at sgbcog.org. Uh, sgb Sorry about that. Um, we have another question from Machico. What improvements are the city of Alhambra and San Gabriel planning for Valley Boulevard? Um, they're planning improvements to uh, add supplemental lanes to try to reduce the levels of congestion, particularly in that segment uh, between, you know, free, near Fremont. Uh, and then uh, we have, an, hopefully that answered your question, Machika. We have another question from an anonymous attendee 
when can we expect this new BRT service to be operational? Well, how do you want to take that? Yeah, so as we, you know, we we showed you the tiered plan with the long range vision plan. Again, I just wanted to clarify that is like a wish list. Should we be able to tap the skies and the clouds and just make it rain money? Um, at, uh, you know, we've addressed our long term regional transit needs and we just basically identify projects that would enhance that connectivity, uh, the intercity and interregional connectivity to, you know, the greater part, part of Los Angeles, like, uh, like the previous um, uh, question that we received regarding, the, you know, the connection to Union Station. So we would facilitate that by using the Union Pacific Railroad subdivision. So, but that is an unfunded plan. When we spoke of the midterm plan, that is actually the plan that's realized that is that that is being funded through the six hundred and thirty six million dollars, uh, which is programmed to twenty thirty five. So that is the earliest that you will see the full network be constructed and provided uh, to the residents and use transit users in the SGD. However, like I said earlier, uh, we are trying to work uh, to identify funding. Uh, we submitted a grant application in excess of $130 million that supports uh, Metro's regional effort in support of the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not sure if the attendees are aware, but there is a plan that addresses the mobility needs for the uh, attendees of the Olympic Games in 2028. And this plan that was recently developed by Metro called the uh, 2028 Mobility Concept Plan uh, calls for a zero car Olympics. And what that means is, is that none of the venues for the Olympics will have parking for automobiles. So unfortunately, uh, all spectators that, that plan to attend the future Olympic games will only be able to access those venues and the games via transit. So, um, as you can, as you may be aware, that's, you know, that's a huge task ahead of us. And we they Metro has provided a developed a plan that is currently unfunded. So we are we are all working hard to identify funding to help realize and implement uh, the projects included in the uh, Metro's mobility concept plan for 28 Olympics. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. So should we get funding um, through this uh, um, grant application that was submitted to the federal government in the last several months? We should be uh, getting wind of whether or not Metro will be receiving those uh, the $130 million in grant funds that was requested by uh, sometime in spring of next year. So should we be, get, be awarded those funds, we would have to go through the exercise of you know, the operational analysis to figure out um, who's going to maintain uh, and operate the services. We'd have to go through the next phase to basically go through the environmental uh, documentation and clearance. So we would have to make sure that you know um, the, the project is. Uh, we uh, we don't anticipate any problems. There is a current exemption for BRT or bus rapid transit, so it would be a we 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 think it would be a fairly streamlined process for environmental, and then we would have to go through the final design process as well. So, I mean, I, th I think that the earliest we could probably go through that is within, you know, all of that would be uh, prior to the 28 Olympics. So, um, all, and again, it would be subject to funding availability as well. Um, hope that answers your question. The next question, can you show the slide with the 2035 projects? Yeah, back it up two slides. It's two slides before the one that's currently being shown. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, what you see there, uh, the north-south alignments in blue, uh, and then you see this hybrid concept of major east, the, the basically the east-west alignment shown uh, originating out of the Atlantic Station in red um, across uh, up along Garvey, um, down to Valley, uh, to Hacienda, Halliburton, Kalima, uh, Grand Temple Valley, and then ultimately terminating at the Pomona North Metrolink station. Um, so hope that clarifies uh, and answers your question. Also to the anonymous attendee, um, we will be uploading the PowerPoint presentation by December 1st. So please check our website 
early next week and you may be able to download um, all of the deliverables and the documents uh, that have been prepared for the study today. Um, next question, why is the Ramona Bad Badillo corridor excluded? I believe there was a BRT study for this corridor about 10 to 15 years ago. Well, you know, at the beginning of the study, the focus is really looking at the SR60 corridor, and that really is outside of the primary study area. So uh, there's a lot of service along I-10, and you've also got Metrolink, and you've got the A-line uh, light rail up there. So um, those are some of the reasons why there, there wasn't a look at that area. Yeah, and again, to kind of further uh, uh, what Brent had just uh clarified, the funding was specifically um, provided to the San Gabriel Valley COG uh, to look at how we can replace the services lost due to the extension along the rail, light rail extension along the 60 freeway. So there was a focus south of the 10 freeway on the southern half of the um, San Gabriel Valley subregion. Um, and then as, as the study progressed, we had heard uh, request to have connecting north-south services. So although a lot of the focus is on the east-west corridor, uh, we believe that the north-south um, um, alignments also benefit by, by providing that extra connectivity from that would span from the north to the south portion of the, the basically the entirety of the SGB. Um, and then there was also a primary focus to serve what Metro has deemed equity-focused communities, uh, which is another term for um, to the transit dependent and low income populations within our communities as well. So we believe that our alignment basically transverses through those communities uh, and, and addresses the needs of those uh, of those impacted communities and populations in our, in our SGB. Um, next question. Why was the wait that that was the question. Sorry about that. So uh, Christopher Mathers had a question about uh, was there no option for dedicated BRT between El Monte Busway and Metrolink Station and the A line Monrovia Station? Um, that would be the, that would be provided by the, the uh, priority bus corridor that we did, delineated along Myrtle and Peck provides that connection. So um, that is shown in the plan as a as a priority bus corridor. Um, could potentially in the very long term support BRT, but. Uh, you know, it, it, in this arc incarnation, we would start with the uh, rapid bus type operation. Yeah, so that just basically means that we will have signal equipment that would give priority to the buses uh, at a red light to give them possibly a jump start ahead of general purpose traffic. So outside of those uh, signal tweaks and enhancements, we are not proposing currently um, that we dedicate lanes uh, along that portion of the corridor. Hope that clarifies your question and answers your question as well, uh, Christopher. Uh, we had a final, I believe this might be the last question. Uh, when will the recording of this webinar be made publicly available? I think I answered that answer, uh, the question earlier. Um, along with the presentation, uh, this recorded presentation, uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation, the recorded presentation from today's community meeting will also be available by December 1st. So, um, I would, I would just give us a few days uh, and by early next week, we expect to have all of the materials updated on our website at the COGS website. Um, are there any additional questions? Okay, I don't see any additional questions and I'm, I know we're 35 minutes over. So for all those attendees today, uh, that have attended the presentation and then stayed along, uh, you know, you know, a little longer uh, to uh, field the questions and answers with our consultants and the COG study team. I sincerely appreciate your time. Again, I know, um, you know, to to dedicate your time during lunch is a lot to ask, and I believe we had an excess of thirty five uh, participants today. So I'm excited that our reach was broad and that you guys were able to see our outreach materials that invited you to the meetings. And again, we encourage you to stay involved through the duration of the study. Um, should there be the next step that uh, Metro directs uh, at the spring of next year, and if we get funding for the early jumpstart projects, 
you know, we will continue our community engagement process with you guys. Uh, this is just the beginning of the study. Um, as we had indicated earlier, the current $635.5 million to $636 million is currently programmed. What that means is we that is made available uh, by 2035. So there's a lot of work ahead. We are doing our darndest here internally with the study team, Metro, between Metro, the COG, and Supervisor District 1 to identify any and all available funding uh, that we can use now uh, as soon, or as soon as possible to accelerate these improvements ahead of 2035. I know that, you know, when we had a basically a meeting yesterday uh, at the Hacienda Heights uh, Community and Recreational Center. Uh, it was an in-person meeting in the evening, and we had a representative from Supervisor District 1 note that this was not acceptable to Supervisor Hilda Solis's office, that, you know, the, the horizon and the period of time, the gap between, you know, now and when we could actually use the funding of 12 years was not acceptable. So this is why we're working really hard to make sure that, you know, if there are any available funds that we could tap into, that we will definitely work to apply for those grant funds to acceler accelerate these improvements to the best of our ability. So uh, again, I just wanted to thank everyone involved. Thank I wanted to thank our stakeholders, uh, Supervisor of District 1, Metro. I wanted to thank my colleagues at, at the COG, including Ricky Choi, our Director of Government and Community Affairs, uh, Government Relations and Community Affairs, we have a, a manager here, Martin Medrano. Thank you for your help during the progress of the study. And last but not least, this would not have been uh, possible without the continued support and input from all of the residents here and our writers. Uh, we're hoping that what we have provided and, and presented and, rec and, and, and summed up in our final recommendations is amenable to, to the general audience. Um, you know, and as, 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 as uh, Brent alluded to earlier, in the presentation with the long term. What we can't capture now in this current plan, uh, we will continue to study and keep track of for the long term to see how we can implement those the, the long term vision where, you know, if we could have the, the sky fall with money, uh, but it's all predicated on funding ability, availability, and our ability to seek and, and, and secure those funds. And that is one of the roles of the San Diego Valley and how we work amongst uh, as a conduit between the residents and the cities here and between our grantors and our transit agencies and our elected officials. So we're here to serve and I'm, I'm proud to serve you guys. And so with that, um, if there are no other questions, please feel free to again, contact me via email with any additional comments or questions during the duration of the study for another month. And with that, I'm going to conclude today's uh, presentation and I want to thank you all again. Thank you so much.